Live from the Export Beer Garden Studio, this is the feature-length agenda for whatever date it is today. The Agenda, an alternative commentary collective podcast. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever it is in uh, the space-time continuum that you are listening to this. My name is Manaya Stewart. I am joined by Matt Heath and uh, a virtual Mike Lane as well. Uh, we had to start this podcast uh, sharply because... We we're talking for ad nauseum about our upcoming trip. And yeah. We're thinking, well, hang on, this is actually an ACC uh, relevant mm. experience that we're about to go on. Yeah. And all the various different um, approaches to the to the trip. Yeah. Well, G Lane's just told me I'm only allowed to bring one pair of undies and a singie because we've got so much, so many prizes that we have to we have to take over. There's so much ACC related gear. There's no room in our luggage for our own stuff. Yeah. I've, I've become no, that's right. We've got, we got a lot to take, guys. We've got, <laughs> we've got state of the ship hats. We've got touch rugby balls. We've got a cricket set we need to take over. Uh, there's some nefarious recording equipment that we need to take over. Um, I'm also selling T-shirts over there as well. So I um, <laughs> need to take a 1,000 T-shirts over. You're allowed one bag with 30 kgs, so it can be a big bag. Uh, okay. I don't mind that. But um, you can do your shopping over there. Because I've, I've got a lot of... Um, Eiffel Tower key rings that I was hoping to sell while I was over there. So I guess I'm going to have to leave some of those behind now. You've been collecting them for years and this is your big opportunity yeah. to make some money back on Who's it? Who's going to want them more than people that are underneath the Eiffel Tower? I just thought I'd sort of gap in the market. But yeah, like you said, Lane, you are running a situation where you're taking one pair of undies and you intend to buy yep. them when you're over there? Correct. That's right. I mean, because we, we fly out to Paris on the Export Ultra Beer Garden Tour on Saturday night with... 24 other of our dearest and closest friends. Oh, Jesus. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so there's like this, I mean, there's. I'm planning to do a lot of shopping over there. I'm planning to basically wear a pair of undies and then just throw them in the bin at the corner of the hotel room and then just... Those, those, uh, no, those, those undies won't make it on the plane, knowing you. Oh, yeah. There'll be That's an accident... Good, There'll be an accident in the, the bar at the airport and those undies will be, they'll, they'll be gone. They'll be flushed, we, they'll be blocking the toilets we, at the, the, the international airport. How are we approaching this seventeen-hour flight to Dubai? By the way, well, yeah. I, I imagine that, approach. Well, I, I was thinking like I'll float this idea mm-hmm. that we arrive at the airport, we put the foot right down, mm-hmm. really, really lean into it mm-hmm. um, before we get on the plane, and while we're on the plane, and then just steam right through, and then see if we can get arrested in Doha and thrown in a jail for um, uh, acting like. Um, What's what's the religious well, rules around Doha? Can you? Well, no, it's Dubai. You, we're going through yeah. it's Dubai, but sort of similar similar vibes. Um, we're going Emirates, so we're going through Dubai. Doha was, I think, a typo there from Joseph Jury, right? Who's he's, he's dangerously confused when it comes to the Middle East and geopolitics. I thought it was strange um, that we're stopping in Doha. What yeah. about? Look, I've told the story of Beat Feet Pete. Yeah. Okay? So my my only warning to you is, if you get off the plane in Dubai. Don't get – just try and act sober as you can. Don't yeah, get together. smart to the locals. Well, um, in the interest of yeah. keeping the plane in the air, um, both literal, literally and metaphorically, uh, what's the alcohol policy on Emirates? Is it is it free? I've heard whispers that there's just basically open bar the whole way. That's not true on a long mm-hmm. haul, is it? Oh, yeah. Oh, jeez. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but they will cut you off. Yeah. They will cut you off. For, for belligerence <laughs> or is it a volume actually, sort of thing? I'm actually looking at the itinerary right here. So it's a 17 flight – 17-hour flight to Dubai, yep. then a seven-hour yep. flight to Paris. Yes. So mm-hmm. that it says here in our itinerary, foot to the floor, hard, straight away, take it deep into the first leg, get a good sleep and wake up hungover in Dubai, bit of breakfast, nice little nap on the second leg, and then um, uh, chuck a bag against the wall at the hotel and uh, full fast and furious straight into the Paris Beer Garden Tour and on the back foot battling deep in your crease for the rest of the trip. That's, the, that's what it says on the official, the official rundown. Mm-hmm. Ooh, yeah, run. well, if it says that on the rundown, that's what's going to happen, I wow. guess. Uh, who are we to question the official rundown that yeah. we just started on the, on the back foot? So, well, well, this is, we I, I think I can keep to this rundown quite easily. 17 hours is a long time. That's enough to get a deep steam, wake up, be hung over, and drink your way out of it again. I think yeah. this is going to be a... It's going to be hazardous. We are all sitting in a line as well, uh, oh. all four of us, the three of us, and Joe Jury. So this is, is going to be... Is there anything worse? Is there anything worse in the world than waking up on a plane hungover and having another six or seven hours to go? <laughs> yeah, just and and like you know that kind of claustrophobia you don't normally have in your life that you do when you're yeah. hungover and you're just stuck oh. on the plane. You're like, get me off, get me off. And the, the key in that moment is not to run for the doors and try and like actually get right. out of the plane. Okay, no, that no, was no, my that's, that's a bad mistake. But every every part of you just wants to end it by jumping out of the plane. <laughs> 
This, yeah, I can't believe you just brought that to my attention. Um, <laughs> by the way, someone else, we've had this excellent story put into the rundown. A British Airways pilot has been sacked after he told a colleague he had taken cocaine off a woman's bare breasts before attempting to embark on a long-haul flight. His name is Mike Beaton of Devon, is said to have told a flight attendant about an alcohol and drug fueled night out in Joburg uh, before his return to London. Is there anything more cocaine than telling the very next person that you saw what yeah. you've just done? It's very Denzel Washington in one of my favourite movies of all time, Flight. Yes, what a great movie that is. He just, but he needed that because sometimes that, made, that, that, I think the moral of that story, that movie flight, is sometimes he was because <laughs> he argues he's so wasted and so drunk and so hungover that if he's going to stop the plane from crashing because the a bunch of problems having the landing gears come off, he's going to have to have another bump. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's the only way he can be sharp enough. So then the pilot's actually <laughs> passenger flight. It's Denzel watching just slamming cocaine on the plane to wake himself up so he can land the plane upside down. Yeah, I just kind of think wrong drug for a long, long haul flight, you know? Yeah. You, you're going to be, like, by the time you're taken off, that's worn off, allegedly. I don't know. That's what I'm hearing. Mm. Um, and so, <laughs> I don't know. Is that where you want? Well, so I don't what, want my I don't want my pilot suggest? I don't want a pilot in a K, in the K, K hole. That's for sure. Yeah, well, that I mean that begs the question: What drug would a pilot um, take there, Manaya? If, if cocaine's not the suitable one, K hole would be terrible. K hole's definitely problematic. K hole would be terrible. I mean, what are you suggesting? Are you suggesting well, look, something I, else? Well, I I, I know that um, certainly if someone has a twenty four hour shift driving forklifts ahead of them, they'd probably lean in towards the um, the crystal pistol. So maybe <laughs> that might be something. <laughs> like if you're going to oh, go yeah. long haul. Um, that oh, geez. You yeah. want you want yeah. a long haul substance. Well, I that, think. that actually begs an interesting question. Would you rather a tired, potentially nodding off pilot, or one that's just running a full steam glass barbecue in the cockpit? <laughs> yeah. Look. Okay. I, I'll answer that one first. Um, potentially, if it, the pilot's not a long term user yeah. of mm. the sucking yeah. on the devil's cock, yeah. because um, you know, obviously, as we know. Uh, in the initial stages, you can be very productive. The house yeah. is very clean, mm. uh, and eventually it turns. So potentially, if the pilot's maybe first or second hone on it, yeah. Yes. Well, you don't want a if pilot that runs out um, of the glass barbecue software. Yeah. He's yeah, halfway to Dubai, and he just mm. suddenly has to fang past West Auckland to um, <laughs> hook up with a guy he knows out there. Yeah, that's right. And I guess the other thing is you don't want him to ram raid a lotto store um, <laughs> on the way out, <laughs> out of Auckland as well. So I guess maybe, yeah. maybe not. Maybe just good old-fashioned uh, eight hours sleep hey, and, hey, a, and an honest work ethic. Hey, quick question. Yeah, is this a so. sports podcast? Uh, yeah, I think so. Vaguely. All right. All right, then. Let's, let's get this back on track with a little bit of sports chat. Here's a, here's a story that popped up on Sosh Med last night of uh, Jimmy Little Lamb Nisham oh, yeah. recounting um, the time he got choked out playing first-class cricket. Now it seems like heaps of white ball teams just seem to be a little bit looser and freer. Is that true of the New Zealand team? I remember literally being choked by one of my senior players at Auckland because I celebrated scoring a try and touch in a warm-up game. Um, and he came up to me and choked me. And he grabbed me by the throat, and he had he was face to face with me, about an inch away from my face. And he said, "If you ever do that again, I'll tear your f- throat out." And I was seventeen, and he was about thirty three. That was what the environment was coming into to professional sports teams, and, and it was horrible. And it was it was dog eat dog. It was such an attitude um, of. I had to suffer so badly when I was coming in that now I'm going to make the most of it and I'm going to do it to the kids that are coming in now. Yeah. And it actually takes quite a strong group to go, you know, that was horrible for us, but we can actually change it and we can be different and we can actually move forward without that. Aside from the fact that that was not the question he was asked. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Lane, what were your thoughts on that, Jan? Oh, look, I would have choked him out as well. I mean, anyone who celebrates in a social game of um, touch rugby um, it, uh, deserves to be choked out, mm-hmm. um, and I, I, I endorse it. Um, uh, he was obviously a 17-year-old kid who he's never lacked confidence, Jimmy Neesham, um, and I can imagine as a 17-year-old coming into the Auckland cricket setup, he would have ruffled a lot of feathers. Mm. And I, I'd I, say, I once ran into a teacher of his, an old teacher of his, and um, – uh, she was on the sideline, and she said to me, um, she was talking about Jimmy, and we were watching a, a game of cricket, some kids, and she was like, Jimmy Nation was such a cocky little fuck <laughs> in school. He fucking hell, arrogant fuck. Like, she was really, really laid into him. So. Wow. 
Um, yeah, so I, maybe, but, but he seems lovely now. Oh, a hundred percent. But I can completely understand as a, I am a thirty-three year old male right now. Yeah. Um, if seventeen year old skinned me, I'd probably try and rip his throat out. So that's all you've got as a thirty-three year old. You know, you can't yeah. you, you can't compete anymore. So there's no like recourse for but, you. But but I guess like if we're going to work it out, so that's sixteen years his senior, and if he's looking face to face, it's got to be at least his height. Well, I've done some research on yeah. this because this was the two thousand nine two thousand ten. Uh, season. I actually reached out to yes. a couple of people who may have been in or around that team, yeah. and a few names got sent back to me. But I've I've yes. crunched the numbers, and the only player who was in that team in 2009 who would have been 33 years old was Scott Styrus. <laughs> <laughs> Peggy Styrus <laughs> yes, was 33 yes. in 2010. Uh, oh, 2009. Yeah, the, the pig. The pig. The, oh him my out. god. The pig would have choked him out. Oh, oh sure. my god, he was choked out by a pig. <laughs> oh, oh no. <laughs> No, I reached out to some contacts. A few names came back to me. Andre Adams got caught in the in the crossfire. He doesn't quite fit the uh, the timeline. Um, so yeah, Scott. Starr. I was looking at that as well. I was like Chris Martin. Like, and I was like, no way. Tommy Martin wouldn't hurt a fly. But now you've said. Yeah. Scotty Styrus. <laughs> yeah. I can imagine that checks Jimmy out. Nisham skinning him, skinning him on the outside and celebrating. And yeah. then Styrus would have just come in with the full throttle on a 17 year old kid. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't think of anything more frustrating than that. Yeah, um, there's a hell of a question, but the, the yeah, like I said at the start, the weird part of that for me was that was not the question that they asked them. They were like, oh, "What's yeah. the difference between the white ball and the red ball team?" And he's just like, "You know, Scott Storis once choked me out at training." <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so true, so true. Yeah, it's like, like he was looking. He just huffed oh. the pig under a bus. <laughs> just he must have been looking, looking for revenge. He was going to whatever the question was. It'd be like, um, how, how are you prepping? Are you feeling good for the for the upcoming uh, tournament? Fucking Styrus, <laughs> high seventeen. He was going. He was whatever question he was answering it. Now there could have been some oh. editing in that. Maybe that's not how that sound, sounded in the podcast. Like they might have clipped it down just so that it, it sounded a bit better. But never. I don't know. Um, I, that's you know how what? I'm going to start doing that. Do no. you know what? I reckon if you ask Scott Styrus, do you have any regrets throughout your career? He'll go, no. <laughs> only 100% no yeah, that, that I didn't rip his throat out when he's he, like, it was like that was a highlight yeah. it was a highlight of my career <laughs> yeah the celebrating one uh, kills me um, on the cricket front when when does this World Cup ever start like is it I feel like it's one of those sort of disappearing mirages where we're like get closer and closer and then you hear the Black Caps played last night you're like oh no hang on that's not the World Cup yet how long have we got? Another month? I think it's in a week. It's in a week's time. Oh, it's God. in a week's time we play England. I think on the fifth of October we play England in the opening match. I think it's not far away, Minai. Okay. Good. Um, and then we're into it. And then there is one weekend where I believe it's the quarterfinal if we make the quarterfinals, uh, and we also play Australia that weekend overnight. What? So wow. there could be a twenty-four hour bender on our on our hands there because we wow. could have a. A New Zealand Australia game throughout the night, straight into an All Blacks Ireland quarter final. Oh, I love at it. At eight AM on a Sunday. Yeah, just what we need off the back of a week long bender in Paris. So we mashed the bangers. <laughs> so we're, we're looking all right. We mashed the bangers. Yeah, mashed the bangers with the B team. Yeah, mashed the bangers with the B team. First game washed out, but uh, it's not easy to win in in Bangladesh, particularly because you play underwater at this time of year. <laughs> So yeah, it's sort of water polo. It's sort of it's sort of like water polo meets cricket. It seems to be the kind of place as well where they'll set the fire alarm off at three a.m. You know those kind of things. Maybe set a, a car alarm outside your yeah. your room. What's the best thing about watching a Bang- The best thing about watching a Bangladesh team is if they lose a game, then all the sponsors abandon ship, <laughs> and then they yeah. turn up in the shirts for the next game with different sponsors on. They're like, "We're out. You lost one game. We're gone." <laughs> yeah, off yeah. That's the, I mean that you, that is true. That's that's how the commercial model in Bangladesh works. I, I heard from someone who was very close to it saying that it's just crazy that if the team's doing well, sponsors pile on and then as they lose one and then they just completely change out the sponsorship the next week. It's, they said it's crazy. But Bangladesh, I think it's up in the top three in terms of cricket associations and the number of players and supporters and commercial model behind India, um, I think, and then maybe Pakistan. But it's massive. It's massive. Yeah, it doesn't help them when we put, put them at the University Oval um, in uh – October in New Zealand. That, that, that's, that doesn't care. Your commercial model is not going to help you. University Oval, mate. No, unless you've got three beanie sponsors because you're going to need to wear all three of them. Um, all right, let's put cricket to bed. <laughs> Rugby, Mystic Manaya has missed the mark for the first time in about a month. I predicted the team yesterday. All of the players that I predicted are in the squad, but some of the players that I predicted to start are on the bench. 
some that I predicted to be on the bench are starting. The biggest one is Tyrell Lomax that I thought was going to be back uh, in the starting lineup. He's coming off the bench. Uh, Sam Kane is also going to be coming off the bench. Uh, so I think, look, I've talked to my sources. I've got some sources in the camp. Mm. Um, there's allegations that I'm holding some children hostage. I'm not going to address those here. That's between me and the people, me and the selectors and me and my informants. Um, and look, they're a little bit too vague. We've had the discussion already. They know what the consequences are and they are dire. Uh, and so we, we're going to leave it at that. I was about 90% right, I think. I called most of the, the players, but they are not leaving any stone unturned here, are they, Lane? No, they're not. I think this 23 is the 23 that will play Ireland on the 15th of October. Um, I don't think there's going to be many changes out of the 23, potentially starting-wise. Yeah. So obviously, you've got dog roll and lurch starting. Obviously, white locks on the bench for this one. But I think this is this is potentially our best. This is our best 23. Hang uh, on, is this is this, is this white locks 149th or his 50th? Ooh, don't know. He matched sure. Richie sure. McCaw in his last game. Right. So this is his 149th. Right. Yeah. And and. And I have been saying that any self-respecting Cantabrian or Kiwi in general should retire so that they don't yeah. break uh, <laughs> Sir Ritchie's, um, you know, record. But obviously... It will be a, it's going to be a great question in 20 years' time, isn't it? When, uh, you know, on a Trivial Pursuit question is who is the, you know, who's played the most game for the All Blacks? Nine times out of ten, people are going to go Richie McCaw. Yeah. yeah. In 20 years' time, like, Sam Whitelock. <laughs> Yeah, Ooh, yeah, that is that is the hallmark of me and my father getting drunk is going through Wikipedia and trying to name all All Black Centurions, anyone who's any Kiwi who's played three hundred games in the NRL, those kind of things. White, right. White Lock yeah. always gets forgotten. So uh, career ending injury in his one hundred forty ninth game, <laughs> like some Italian wound, it just takes his brain out of his skull. Well, it's a great question. Um, I'd like to take you back to 2010 when Scott Storrs choked out uh, Jimmy Neesham. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> what about what about the Namibian player that just smashed? And on Dupont's face, like you, is a is he in the is he in the pocket of big all black? Is that that what's going on here? Like, just it seemed like a hit job, wasn't it? We and now he's trying to. Is he going to play as the Phantom of the Opera with some kind of face mask on? That's what we're hearing. But we had called for this, hadn't we, Lane? Before that game, we were just like, why doesn't someone just go out there and take Antoine Dupont out? <laughs> Um, now, obviously, that's just a podcast. We can't have that kind of impact on the no. game. Um, but right. it does seem suspicious that we called for it and then it happened the very next game, doesn't it? Well, yeah. And, like, obviously, Namibia have not, not got a chance to go through. But there's certainly been brown paper bags full of money floating around oh, yeah. um, before in the sporting world. This is what we said <laughs> going into that game. We were just like, why don't you bring someone into the Namibian team and just be like, look, I'm going to make it very clear for you. This is what you're in the team for. Check, Do, this check, is your one chance to play for your country. Check the CCTV footage on the Namibian Hotel and <laughs> just see uh, Fozzie Bear yeah. skipping out, giggling, <laughs> skipping in with two briefcases. Like, how come we've got this guy who's just been released from Namibian prison about a week ago? <laughs> he's never. There's no record of him having ever played rugby before, and he's yeah. just scald Dupont. He's yeah, the, he's a Namibian strangler. Has been brought into the team. <laughs> yeah. He's a famous serious co- serial killer. Yeah, you watch, lead with the head. Lead with the head. Uh, the Namibian strangler. Um, the All Blacks play <laughs> next on uh, Saturday morning, uh, obviously against Italy. Uh, this one, we need to make a statement, don't we? D- could this be the ton, Heath? Could this be the famous ton we're after? Yeah, either that or we lose. Mm. Mm. <laughs> oh, my God. If you think I, there was I, a pile on, I, I, if you I think there's a pile on in Australian <laughs> rugby. If we lose to Italy, <laughs> yeah. that, that, like, I don't know what's bigger than a pile on. What's well, bigger than a pile on? Yeah, I'm not sure what a pile of. Uh, but the thing with um, a pile on, the, the thing, the thing with yeah, a, a pile literal on, pile on, a little pile, a literal pile on will fall down on <laughs> on Fozzie's head. The thing is, you, there's no point. Like, look what you know happened in in you know in in the last game where you get uh, you know a player being knocked out for two games for the red card just because you're trying to get a lot of points against a team. Yeah. Once you're going to beat Italy, just stand back. Just just stay just ahead of them. Put the cue in the Def- rack. Definitely don't um, go hard under the high ball. Like, let them have it and then mm. and then tackle them. And then just just tackle as low as you can. Yeah. You know, even if you only beat Italy by 10 points, who gives a shit? Just, you just don't want a, a Scott Barrett dog roll red card hanging over you as you go up against uh, Ireland. Yeah. It'll be a prop as well. Yeah. And we can't afford that. We can't that. lose a prop. <laughs> we don't have oh enough. Oh, my God. Offer to a fussy. I, I, it's, it's, something's going to happen. Someone's going to run to it, run into his shoulder. Just yeah. desperate gonna, to get, get the ton off. and force yeah. a turnover to try and get 100. Yeah. And then get 
get suspended for two games. Hey, speaking of pylons, hasn't it been great to watch the Aussie media turn on Eddie Jones this week? I yeah. mean, he, uh, we've been saying this the entire time. He's an absolute goober. He, he, like when he's winning, all the stuff he does looks cute. But when he starts losing, when you start hearing that he's been having all these interviews with other teams, hasn't it been just excellent to watch the Australian media just cannibalise one of their own? Sonny Bill Williams really came in hot on yeah. him. Yeah, tore him a new one. Yeah, tore him a new one about taking yeah. a call from the Jap- Japanese before the tour. Yeah, also, Sunny Bell on the on field there for the Australian coverage had a dangerously small ACC jacket on. I don't know if you saw that. <laughs> Someone's obviously sent him over Jason Hoyt's ACC jacket and the beige jacket, and it was so tight it couldn't come undone. The sleeves were halfway out the arm, but I'm not going to criticise the man's fashion. Hey, he's he's good a looking man. good looking man. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's got a great rig. But, yeah, he even said, like, there's a player – there's, there's someone in the studio back there that should be over here playing. Morgan Tudanui. Is that what he's saying? <laughs> <laughs> you reckon he should be over there? Yeah, um, Michael Hooper was just sitting. He's part of the oh, panel, and he's just sitting there with a smug look on his face, and he's saying, yeah. look, we can't blame Eddie Jones. He's like, he could, you know, <laughs> mate, he, he dropped you, but and that's, that's sucks. But that's the best because you don't need to – you don't need to pile on if you're him no, because the whole country's no. going, yeah. why the fuck is that guy there? Yeah. <laughs> and not there where he's needed. Um, one more shot at humiliation for the Australians this weekend as well. Uh, they are taking on Portugal. There is some sort of mathematical equation where they can still make the um, the playoffs, but I don't think it's going to happen. So um, we, can, we can enjoy their demise. Wouldn't it be great if they lost to Portugal? I oh. mean, it would just be the best. <laughs> The best ever. Oh, God. All right, hopefully that happens. Let's uh, park rugby. Rugby league. Uh, we'll get into the Dally M of it all in just a second, but win, lose, or draw, it's been our year, hasn't it? Up the waz. Uh Heath, I know you were all in on um, the Warriors. You actually retroactively established yourself as a day one supporter <laughs> uh, halfway through this season. Well, it's a, it's a win for me this year because last year I, at the start of the season, uh, put decided to put 100 bucks on the Warriors on the head every mm. game for the year. And I lost twelve one thousand two hundred dollars. <laughs> so yeah, there was a low bar for it to be my se- my year this year. It was a, it was a very low bar, and it well exceeded that. Although, I, such- if I'd done it this year instead of choosing last year as the year to go, okay, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. Everyone says there's, there's no chance. <laughs> yeah. Diane was going, "What are you doing?" You know, the biggest supporter of the Royals of all time last year, and I go for it. This year, I could have gone for it, yeah. and and I would have I would have come out on top. So yeah, would have. It- it was such a strange way to show your loyalty last year. Yeah. You, 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 were in a, you were panicked and you were like, <laughs> I need to show that I'm supporting the team. So I'm just going to put a hundred bucks. And we worked out if you actually put a hundred bucks on every <laughs> team the Warriors played, yeah. you would have been $6,000 up <laughs> if you just, but you were, you, and your blind loyalty, you're like, no money. I'm going to throw money at the problem. Money will buy my loyalty. <laughs> and it was the most bizarre. And every week I said, everyone would be like, don't do it. And you chuck another hundy on. Well, I had be to. Like, no, don't do it. I had to. So now, now that you have seen that this year you would have made money, what's your approach next year? Ah. Uh, Thousand? Well, I feel like the Warriors are bring, bringing me enough joy this year without me having to make money on top of it as well, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, 100%. That's why you don't gamble on like, yeah. for or against the Warriors. Yeah. And, you know, we've got the coach of the year. He's on till the end of 2025. So there's a bit of consistency. And I was liking what um, Cameron George was saying about the same players on the field. Yep. You know, like just consistency so people feel like they're part of the team. So I feel we've got the same team next year. Yep. With a, with a, with a, with a nice little addition. 100%. So. And 200 on the head every game? I reckon I don't really see any <laughs> other option for you. I think you're just going to have to spank it. Well, let's get into the Dally M of it all then um, because we had three players in the Dally M team of the year. We had uh, Dallin Watini's Lesniak was in on the wing. We had Sean Johnson uh, at halfback and Adam Fenua Blake, the prop. But the headline is that Sean Johnson pipped at the post for the yeah. Dally M. Uh, Kalen Ponga won it, and in the end, if you're not familiar with how the system works, they award a 3-2-1 point system like you do in club rugby. Best player gets three, second best player gets two, um, blah, blah, blah. What happened this year was, because Sean Johnson, uh, he was ahead of the pack going into the last round, but he didn't play the last round. Oh. Kalen Ponga oh. leapfrogged him by getting, you can get it, so there's two lots of 3-2-1 available, so the total you could get in one round is six points. But too much, man. Mm-hmm. But the long and short of it was, he leapfrogged him. Had Sean Johnson just played that last game and scored one point from each of the two judges, he would have won his rightful uh. spot. So it's a mathematic thing. Should we have rested him? 
Mm. Was it worth playing him just to secure the Dally M if we hadn't known that that's where it was going to go? Like, Lane, would you have played and injured Sean Johnson just to get the Dally M? No, I think we've, we've got the moral Dally M. Yeah. We've got the moral Dally M. Um, I think that's important. And Sean Johnson, you know, he's he, he was pretty pretty grown up about it when they were talking to him. Um, he's probably he's probably good mates with Callum Ponger as well. Mm. Um, but we all know that he actually won the Dallium. Yeah. He, well, we know he won it. you got to so say, it's he, a bit we of, know he was the best It's player. a better system than most of these kind of systems where it's just the vibe at the end of the season. So, you know, at least they yeah. have a system that runs right through the season. It, it is in that it's completely transparent and you can yeah. go through and you can see exactly what points they got from what team. The problem is it favours good players on shit teams because for Kalen Ponga, there's no one in his team that's ever going to take the three points off right. him. Right. So he, every week, ah. is going to get the three points. Whereas that's, Sean, a very, that's a very good point. Sean Johnson ha- might have, Toru Harris might have a better game. Right. Dallin might have a better game. Chance, AFB, all these different things. So he's actually been punished a little bit for being on a better team. Wow. That, who who are the judges? Uh, so they have different judges every round, and there's two of them this year. There was a, uh, They brought that in this year. But they're dudes like, like Joey Johns might um, do it one week or, you know, former players and legends or different dudes um, throughout the, the season. So, where, was, where was Cleary in the mix? Well, this is another thing. So he was injured for a, a fair oh, chunk yeah, of the right, season. Right, right, so, yeah. so he wasn't really in the mix. But also he also falls victim to the same thing Sean Johnson did where he's in a good team. So yeah. there's going to be outstanding players yeah. here and there. It's only because, I mean, uh, Kalen Ponga missed uh, a fair chunk of the season as well. But again, he was a yep. massive. And you, look, I... I can't take it away from him. He was clearly, like, if not the best player in the NRL, you know, the second best player in the NRL this year. He was absolutely incredible. But I do wonder if there needs to be a bit of room for vibe. I know, like like you say, it's good that it's transparent. But, again, it rewards. Like, Nico Hines won it last year, and he was definitely the best player in the league. But, again, no one in his team was so, going to so, punch So points. maybe it needs to be put in front, front of a jury at the end and you raise with a – Raise points in mitigating circumstances. You go, but his team's fucking shit. So, yes, you know. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's, um, yeah, it's a good stats, bad team sort of thing. But yeah, Webby won uh, Coach of the Year. We had three dudes. I mean, we never have three guys in the NRL Team mm. of the Year. So yeah. um, right. that is our year. <laughs> Reports of a big time EPL owner bringing an A League team to Auckland, fellas. Do we want, or more importantly, do we need? Another uh, A-League team in New Zealand. Well, where would they play? Well, I will... Because cause, cause I think the pro- biggest problem with the Phoenix is the, the, the seats, right? So yeah, you, there's you, too you, many you got, of them. You've got, there's too many seats and they're too <laughs> brightly coloured. And you, if, if you're going to have a successful franchise, you need a stadium that, you know what I mean? That We don't have any stadium that they could fill with 5,000 people or 10,000 people, you know, so it actually creates an atmosphere. Yeah, maybe the North Shore... Um, yeah, but they tried that with the North Kings Harbour. all those years ago, and it's a fucking long way away. Yeah, look, and Albany Stadium is not <laughs> not great. It's like a half stadium, so yeah. a half man. It's a half man of a stadium. It's got one great stand and then a car park on the other <laughs> side. So what, what you know, what you are looking for is a Craven Cottage kind of thing, like a kind of London Millwall fits like ten thousand great yeah. atmosphere. And you, and you, uh, and you get it, for you football. Get, you get it set up for rugby league. Um, Soccer, both women's women's yep. rugby, the whole thing. It's, it, it just plays for those rectangular sports. Yep, get the mm. Tuatara playing baseball out there as well. <laughs> but the thing is, like um, billionaires, like so, there's a billionaire looking at coming in and putting this in here. Yeah. But normally, like say you like, take so- SoFi Stadium in um, LA, that billionaire just came in and said, "Yeah, I'll spend um, uh, ten billion dollars building a stadium if I can have the team there, and then the whole government like the." Often, when it goes with franchises, you have to come in and you have to build the stadium yeah. as well. You know, it's part and parcel of getting the franchise. Is this a way to get Auckland's waterfront stadium built? If, yeah, if just a like, small one. Instead of building a really massive one, yeah. just build something that can pack out, that can get good crowds for MP- MPC, yep. good good crowds for, for football, you know, and, and you have your finals and stuff at Eden Park if you get through and, you, and you're going to get bigger crowds. Yeah. But there's no point in fucking having – because it's a good turnout. If you get 8,000 people to go along to yeah. anything, I mean, look how good that looks for the breakers when they're at um, Spark Arena. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Not to get too bogged down in um, actual sports chat, but we basically do have an A-League team playing here in Auckland. Auckland City have won 
pretty much every competition for the last like two decades. They're the only mm. team in the in the local domestic competition that basically has a payroll. I don't know whether it's on the books or off the books, but they have an A League uh, calibre payroll, and they're just obliterating teams <laughs> up and down the country, and have done for about a decade now. So I think it's uh, from a from a Sporting perspective, it's more about getting those blokes out of our domestic comp and putting them into a, a trans Tasman one than it is about um, actually putting a team, putting another New Zealand based team in there. Um, if, seems, if, seems like a good, good, good way to go bankrupt, I reckon. Yeah, you know, look, if another A League team is the catalyst for us to get a manageable rectangular stadium in Auckland, yep. then I'm all for it. But if it doesn't, I'm not for it. I don't think we're strong enough to have two A League teams. A t- a t- I think a conversation t- should be around the league and the basketball before that. Well, a, yeah, a ten thousand seater stadium at the outer oval at Eden Park would be the thing to do. Yeah, a hundred percent. Well, let's let's on on the basketball that you just mentioned. Then the Breakers season starts this weekend. It starts on Saturday, if you can believe that. that wow, one, that, yeah, that one has snuck up. Are they uh, New Zealand's most underrated professional franchise? Do you reckon? Yeah, well, they've won four titles, haven't they? Yeah. They've won four. Titles. Imagine if the Warriors won four titles, or <laughs> yeah. the Phoenix won four titles. It's a, it's pretty, and they won three on the trot. Remember, yep. and they actually the Aussies got so uh, upset that they changed the rules to make sure that the the Breakers didn't win four in a row. Um, they are they are pretty much the under, most underrated franchise. And but I love going along to those games. It's it's at Spark, If you go to Spuckerina for a Breakers game, that those final series last year was up there. It was up there with a kind of a Warriors crowd in t- in terms of energy. So look, I I think I think they are. I think they run a great ship at the moment. Um a great entertainment package and they're a good team to watch and it's if you've got a chance go and watch it's awesome. I think one of the things they fall victim to is uh they obviously covid ruined them. They were overseas, no one saw them. They were last. Then they had this massive turnaround uh to make the grand final last year. They've got storylines on and off the court though. You will be familiar Lane with uh Cheeky the Care. Just yes. just two years ago, Cheeky the Kia uh, was, um, and look, spoiler alert, uh, there's actually a man inside that suit. That man. It's not a Kia. It's not that, a Kia. That man is now the GM. He And last year, <laughs> he won GM of the year in the wow. NBL. Have you heard a bigger rags to riches story than uh, Cheeky the Kia Becoming GM of the franchise and then going to a grand final in the same year, winning GM of the year. And so did he turn up to the awards GM of the year as the Kia and then yell, fuck everyone. <laughs> fuck everyone. Fuck everyone. Fuck everyone. He should have because while he was cheeky the Kia, he was also the MC. So he would duck off around the back and be like, ladies and gentlemen, please be upstanding for your <laughs> New Zealand breakers. They were calling him the GMC because I, I, he's the MC and the GM and I, cheeky the Kia. I had this thought about like um, basketball and football as opposed to league in New Zealand because there's the NBA and then there's the premiership. That, that you know that that splits people's loyalties. So everyone that likes the Breakers also has an NBA team that they love. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. And but but you know the Warriors play in the league, the absolute top of league in the entire yeah, world. Right. So all your league love can be put into Ooh. that. But um, the Breakers do have to compete with the NBA. And, yeah, that's and, right. And the and all New Zealand football has to compete with the Premiership. Yeah, one hundred percent. And they're actually going to be playing an NBA team um, in another couple of weeks in mid October. So bizarrely, they're going to start their season. Then they have to go play the Portland Trailblazers, um, and then they have to come back in Portland. Uh, yeah, I think yeah. they're going to play in Portland. How cool! Yeah, it'd be very yeah. cool, but also like bizarre. I suppose that's the power of the NBA, like you say. Yeah. The NBA would be like, do you want to play against the Trailblazers? Yep, when? Um, middle of your season? Oh. Uh, yep. Okay, um, yeah. <laughs> fuck. Yeah, any other time? No. No. Ah, oh, fuck. Yep. <laughs> yep. Hey, that was, um, that's a really heartwarming story around the Kia, by the way, <laughs> Manaya, because yeah. can we get him in to speak at our uh, mascot supporters support group that we've got going on? Because there's a lot of people out there who have been a mascot and been hurt. Uh, yeah, you included Matt, myself with Rambo, and people got in touch after I poured my heart out about how I almost strangled myself on the net uh, <laughs> down there at um, Horncastle during the, the, the theme night. Yeah. There was an outpouring of sympathy. A lot of people came to me um, saying, look, they too were um, like um, Turbo turbo Man yep. um, out of Manawatu and got, got assaulted with a bucket. Um, and people <laughs> were people – so, I mean, look, this is a really good story, and I'd, I'd like to reach out to – um, the Kia and get him to come and speak to us and say that there is a future for people who have been mascots. Yeah, yeah Jason Hoyt was um, a, a mascot for the Warriors for for a long time early on. Yep, he got, took a massive pounding. 
Um, he wouldn't have even had to wear the mask, just paint his face. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, he was called the handbag. <laughs> Um, I've told the ballad of Steely Dan before on this podcast where he um, went into quite a brutal contract negotiation and then showed up to the next game, uh, full face of uh, silver spray paint on and chased kids around with a raw chicken. Um, <laughs> just didn't handle it very well. I've heard stories of Steely Dan throwing up in front of the, <laughs> the crowd as well. Um, I don't know if that's from the paint fumes or, or what. I had to wear the LJ Hooker beer at the Waimati Strawberry Fair one year. Um, kid, kid kicked me in the nuts there as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah so. um, my name is Matt Heath. I was the Rudy Jagermeister's, uh, Rudy the Jagermeister stag for a number of years. Um, Hi, my, my balls got absolutely worked over. See, look, that's why this Kia story is so inspirational because everyone's just got a story of being dressed up and assaulted by small children. Just, just when you need money in your life, when you're at a low point, yeah. and you know, yeah. you, yeah, Paul, put on a suit and get kicked in the nuts for it's like nine dollars fifty an hour. Sure, I think it was nine fifty. Wow, you got nine fifty. I didn't, Jesus. I didn't even get paid. Um, <laughs> there was also the time when Benny the Bull was um, the guy passed out. So the, the trick was he was going to be lowered from the rafters, but while he was waiting to descend from the rafters, he passed out in his costume. And so they <laughs> lowered a lifeless corpse to centre court. <laughs> um, I still reckon they're covering up the fact that he died in those rafters. <laughs> yeah. Could always get away with it. Um, all right, let's put that one to bed then. Behind the absolute scenes, too, uh, has come out at, I mean, I suppose there's never a good time to put these stories out, uh, but we've got the latest episode. Uh, it's the final episode of season two, and it's out at 4 p.m. today. A number of us were probably carrying a number of diseases and so forth. That Arse on the Glass promotion was one of the best radio promotions I've ever been associated with. Well, the crowd were banging on the side of our caravan all day. They were trying to climb in the windows. They said we were inciting um, drinking. And that was it, I think. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. Poor Lee Hart had to buff so many beers. Um, I don't recall that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, this, is, this, this episode here is pretty much... It, it, Details when the party was over, when we basically, they're like I mentioned there, was the, as Lee Baker said, the straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah. This was when the officialdom finally went, these guys are actually such a pain in the ass. Why are we even tolerating their behavior? Why The caravan is a Trojan horse. Yeah. They've, got the, they've got a bar in the back of it. They're, they're basically, they're getting out bits of glass and people are getting nude and putting their genitalia against it and... Yeah. So, yeah, this just details was those a, last few weeks before we were actually banned from most grounds. It was like Helm's Deep in the um, Two Towers, but Gandalf doesn't turn up and save the day. <laughs> there was yeah, no Gandalf. You look to the <laughs> east at the first light on the fourth day and you're like, oh, nah. fuck. It was Gandalf standing on the hill giving you the bird and then, then riding off. <laughs> I'm sure, shadow facts. I'm sure this next question I'm about to ask you is answered in the video, but... The Butch Ass Against the Glass, for anyone that wasn't familiar with it, where did it come from and was it a necessity because people were doing it already and you needed to give them somewhere to do it? Yeah, it was the Butch Ass Against the Glass grab bag where you could put your ass against, because we have a, the Radio Hodaki studio has got a glass wall <laughs> and so people started putting their ass against the glass and when we were doing our show. And then, um, and then we thought, oh, well, let's try and turn this into a radio promo. So we started uh, giving people prizes. If you came down and stuck your ass against the glass, you could win the ass against the glass grab bag. But then, stupidly, it got so popular that we started travelling on the road with some a, a, like a, a sheet, of, sheet glass of glass for people with their ass against. Yep. And the, uh, so that wasn't even the ACC's fault. That was a Radio Hodaki promotion that was circling around the ACC that, that you guys got blamed for. And yeah. who, who takes a sheet of glass? It was all drawn up nicely. Yes. And there was a camera there. You could put your ass against your glass and win prizes. But they didn't need to set it up right beside the caravan. We <laughs> became a real hotbed of activity right around their caravan. Yeah, there was a, there was a big line of people looking to put their ass against it and win a prize, um, <laughs> which was fine. But what actually incited the most amount of attention was where a, a, a female fan, yeah, listener, decided that you know if boys are going to do it, I'm going to do it as well. And so she did. And she just robed and put her ass against the glass, which... There was a lot of content in that ass. Yeah, there was a lot of content, and it created a lot of feedback from the crowd. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of interest from the police all of a sudden. <laughs> so, yeah, in this episode, we detail how I actually had to deal with that situation. Um, yeah. And, you know, we're talking about equal opportunities here. Um, there's no reason why 
uh, female fans couldn't have put the ass against the glass, but it caused a, a bit of a stir. When you say content in the ass, what, what do you mean like digital social media content or the ass itself had physical content? What, what I'm saying is like when a man puts an ass right, against right, the glass, right. he'll typically lift his testicles up and then all you're getting is ass. <laughs> okay. But she wasn't in anatomically speaking there, right. was, there was a lot more to see mm. okay yeah yeah um, yeah yeah so just on that i've been out to where our promotional lockup is and all of the ancient i think the mammoth tusks are still out there from that <laughs> season there's all sorts of it's like it's honestly like the tupapa of the acc it's like an evidence locker yeah and it's out station the printing factory for the new zealand herald and it's in a deep dark recess there that glass pane is still <laughs> out there is it and yeah and uh it's in such disrepair obviously no one wanted to touch it so no one's ever cleaned it so there is still um remnants of the last time that it was used oh let's get it let's get that i didn't know it was there let's get that out All that right. is great yeah. intel we'll have to go and we'll have to go and dig that one out that's um, an artifact let's take it to pa- let's take it to paris let's, ta- let's take it pa- pa- paris and when we bring it back let's take it to papa yeah 100 <laughs> percent uh episode well the final episode of season two is out at 4 p.m today Black Clash tickets, Lane, they are on sale now. You can get your tickets to the ACC and export Ultra Beer Garden Party Zone. I think the first release sold out almost immediately, but there's now a second release of tickets. Yep, that's right. The uh, early birds sold out, I think, within a couple of hours. But get into this because we're basically Bay Oval. We've got our own area. I think it's limited to maybe only 500 tickets to the to the uh, Export Ultra Beer Garden Party where you get a, a free steady of the ship hat. You get some sports ears to listen to the commentary. You get a, um, an export shirt. I think we might even chuck in a freshing, a fresh cold frosty Export Ultra for you. You get your own bar. Um, it's going to be loose as a goose. It's going to go off like a frog in a sock. So get onto that. It's going to sell out real quick, that one. So get onto it. It's That is going to be a loose. I think... If you want details, text PARTY to yep. 3236. Is that right, Manai? Yeah, that's PARTY. Right. PARTY. Or you can look it up. Uh, um, yeah. Heath, you've, you're a veteran of the of the Black Clash. What can people expect at the ACC export well, party zone? Last year I got involved in a um, quite uh, Ooh. quite central embrace with uh, Mike Minogue in a hot spring spa pool um, <laughs> in a speedo that, that ended up on, on national television. Oh. Um, it's a good time. Um, I had uh, Daniel Vittori on the Matt and Jerry show uh, yesterday. We did a podcast with him. It's just out today. It's half an hour. And look, I've just got to say, probably best if you don't listen to that podcast, g <laughs> I don't know what okay. happened, but, but Daniel Vittori came on to like announce mm. that the tickets were on sale for the Black Clash. He's captain yeah. in the cricket team. And mm. it just descended into a real character assassination of, of, of you, you G-Lane. I don't that's, know how it happened. A, yeah, I don't know how that would have happened. <laughs> you know, um, he would have been ready and willing and able to uh, to assassinate my character. Well, often um, you ask a question of a sportsman, yeah, and uh, and then they'll just sort of push it to touch and not say much. But mm. opening question was G Lane's a disgrace, disgust, and <laughs> and he just it, it was like the hooker falls. How much came out of him? He did half an hour just and, on and, that one prompt, and you were like Peter Plumley going over those four. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, look, um, he'll keep. That is a man. <laughs> that is a man who's fooled the nation, and he knows. Well, the thing is with Vittori, I remember when he was playing, and we interviewed him in the caravan. It was pre World Cup, and we asked him a question, and he muted his microphone and looked at me and said, "I have Anna's number, and I will call her and tell her what you've been up to." And then unmuted it again, and I was like. Okay. Um. <laughs> this has been working for, uh, you know, the Eastern Bloc and the Western Bloc for a long time. It's just a mutually assured distraction. It, 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 it leads to peace. Yeah. Oh, it totally does. It totally does. There's a mutual respect there that we can both yeah. burn ourselves to the yeah. ground. Yeah. yeah. You're almost like the Yevgeny Prigozhin of uh, New Zealand cricketing media. <laughs> yeah. There's no, no point in conventional warfare when someone's got their finger on the button. Yeah. Uh, yeah totally. 100%. My favourite part of that podcast is when you asked him a question and he just told you about the time Scott Storris choked him out in 2009. <laughs> 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 Completely unprompted. Um, we're also backing black, by the way. This promo, um, you will have got your uh, black paint test pot from Dulux if you've entered it. This is your last call to win yourself an epic Panasonic home theatre prize worth $6,000 and a $500. Dulux voucher. You know who you are if you've got your paint pot. Paint something. We're going to be drawing the winner of that on the 15th of October uh, so you do not want to miss out on that. Let's move on to Wide On 
of the week. Uh, we're going to start with you, Matt Heath. What niche American sport gave you a wide on no, this week? No, I'm going to stop doing that. Because it's too boring even for me to be going on about niche American sports all the time. No, it has to be the Waz and the, the, the interception, intercept, and then you believe. Because Di Henwood mm. said to me, like, what do we need to, to beat the Broncos? And he was like, he literally said, we need an interception and we need some 50-50 calls to go away. We scored first in early, and then uh, Rick James – so Lesniak scores, mm. gets that intercept, and you, got, and you believed. And so in that moment, you, you, you were through to the grand final, you know what I mean? Like in yeah, that moment. Yeah. And so that was enough, and I was in the Morningside Tavern, and the whole place was jumping up and down yep. and pointing at the, the three Australian Broncos fans there and yelling, not so loud now, are you? Yeah. yeah um, and, mm. and then, boy, did they, boy, did they get to, to rub that in our faces as the game went on. But at that point, I, at that point, I thought that the, the, the luck we needed to win that game was going our way. Um, so that's got to be that mo- that moment yeah. was fantastic. That intercept. You're so right. Just just to have that feeling for about five <laughs> yeah. minutes. Yeah. Um, Lane, what what gave you a wide on this week? Yeah, I, it's in the same vein. It was Claxton Street. It was the pregame yeah. for me. The pregame in Brisbane. Um, all the video footage that was being sent to the ACC, which we shared, with all the stuff on, just with Warriors fans like leaning out of balconies and chanting and singing. No, like nothing. Nothing abusive, just different versions of an Up The Wires uh, song and cheering and chanting. And it was so, it was heartwarming to see. And it remi- reminded me of the 2015 Cricket World Cup final in Melbourne. Everyone just getting in behind their team, no matter what. There were people in DWZ uh, wigs. Uh, that was that was heartwarming and gave me a little little bit of a uh, morning wood. Yeah, it's a good point that you raise about like, we gave Aussies a second team to cheer for. You know, it wasn't fuck you Broncos. It was just like, hey, how awesome is this? We're in a bloody prelim yeah. final. And th- I think they really appreciated that. Like, if you were there and you were a Warriors fan, after the game, you could have gone back to Caxton Street and had a couple of beers with, you know, yeah, with the yeah. locals. They wouldn't have been, you know, ramming it down your throat. Um, you could certainly hear the Warriors fans in the stadium. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know what the percentage was, but they were louder. It felt 50 50. Um, what on the week for me? That one, look, it was in, in the running, but it's just, I don't know, too many painful memories associated with that now as well. I think of it as, as, as a loss, despite how great our season was. The what on for the week happened this morning. Um, a massive trade in the NBA, which starts in a couple of weeks. Uh, Damian Lillard, uh, who led the league in scoring last year, he's been traded to the Greek Freaks team, the Milwaukee Bucks. Um, and the NBA is just so transactional. Every player's on a different team every year. So now all of a sudden you've got the Greek freak who genuinely looks like an alien. Um, he's, seven, <laughs> he's, he's seven feet tall. He runs like he's about five foot eight. Um, and now you've got like one of the greatest shooters of all time. Like if Steph Curry didn't exist, we'd be talking about Damian Lillard the way we talk about Steph Curry. So I'm very excited to watch them, and it just makes the NBA this season so much harder to predict. Um, so that gave me a massive wide on. This morning, um, attendance required this week. ABs v Italy, Saturday, 8 a.m., live and free on iHeartRadio and your local radio Hodaki frequency. If you don't know what that is, text north or south to 3236 to get the list of the frequencies, and that's the best way to listen to it too if you've got a, uh, a transistor radio handy because um, then you don't have to sync it up. And then also, we haven't talked about it, but the Panthers are playing the Broncos in the NRL Grand Final, 9.30 p.m. Sunday on Sky Sport 9. A lot of people are asking me this week, are we commentating it? Yes, we are. Obviously, all of us will be um, in transit somewhere, deeply steamed or deathly hungover um, on our way to Dubai. Or Um, arrested. Or arrested. um, But... (laughs) Keezy and Tony Lyle are going to commentate that one live on 9.30, all brought to you by 4 and 20 Pies. Um, just quickly before we get on to the game day, uh, the TAB good punt, who do you guys want to win? Because intensely mm-hmm. unlikable characters on both sides, Reese Walsh for the Broncos, Jerome Luai for the Panthers. Mm-hmm. Hey. I, I always believe that it's better for the team that knocked you out to win. Yeah, because then you can sort of in your mind nip yourself up a place. Yeah, you know you, you you don't want the team that knocked you out to get smoked because that does that's not a good look. And Broncos, good chance, big, young. Yeah, yeah, yeah they're they're a, they're a hell of a hell of a team. Throbbers. And and what's the Cleary situation? Is he injured or is he is he playing? Yeah, he's fine. He's he, fine. He's, he's, he suffered a scare at training the yeah, other day. Scare. But okay, he's, he's fine. So, Sorry. Yeah, I'm with I'm with Matt Heath on this one. I I I think the Broncos have got a better story. You know, two seasons ago, were they wooden spooners? They were two years ago. Yep, wooden spooners. And to be in the grand final now, and like you were saying, there's some really hateable, punchable characters in mm. both of them. Yeah. But um, um, the Panthers have got more punchable ones. I mean, Broncos have just got one really. The the Panthers are littered with them. Yeah. So I'm I'm unfortunately going you, for the Broncos. You just have to block your nose and 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 deal with Reese Walsh and support yeah. the Broncos. 
I can't deal with Reese Walsh. And what I want is for them, whoever loses the grand final just gets banished to the annals of rugby league history and they don't talk about them again. Like, I, I don't think, like, do you know who the Panthers played in the grand final last year? No. Oh, um, Storm? No, Storm? It, it was the Eels. Oh. So yeah. this is what I want to happen to the Broncos this year is that they lose oh. in the grand final. We don't talk about them. The Warriors remain the story of the 2023 yeah. season yeah. and Reese Walsh does not get to rub it in our face. So have, that's Having said that, are any of you guys running a VPN on your laptops? No, I don't Because there's, the there's Wi-Fi on planes now, so we could actually be blasting this game Ooh. on the plane. Oh, is that right? As long as you geo-block. Wi-Fi, alcohol, well, this, is, yeah. this is great. Well, well, this is um, this was going to be the conundrum we were going to face if the Warriors made the grand final. Mm. We were going to be in the air. Yeah. yeah. Well, mm. yeah. I guess we'll never know. All, All right. right. Okay. Time to move on to the TAB game day. Oh. Oh, the TAB good punt. Uh, Lane, did you put this one on? Do you want to walk us yeah, through I've, it? I've got a five-legged cockroach on the MPC. <laughs> uh, look, it's kind of snuck up on us, hasn't it, the MPC? Uh, it's actually almost getting to the pointy end of the season yeah. uh, for MPC, but... I've basically gone for a missionary position, five-legged cockroach multi on all the favourites um, throughout the weekend, and it's kind of tallied up to a decent odds of 470 um, for all of those. And they're all quite heavy favourites, yep. uh, all of those teams in the five games. Have you, have you got on them and I? I do, yeah. You've gone, you've gone chalk for these five games. Uh, Auckland at $1.09, Canterbury, Wellington, Taranaki, Counties, and the highest odds there are Counties at fifty-two over Otago, who got absolutely obliterated last week by Waikato. So um, there's nothing in that that makes me nervous. 470 is good eating. That's yeah, yeah. That, that's, what, that's what I mean. Because I, mean, I think they've what? been a bit ignored by the Rugby World Cup, the Cricket World Cup and the WAS, and the, the good old NPC has been plugging away. So what are you calling that? It's the five-legged cockroach missionary position <laughs> yep. punt. Is it, is that's, it, the, that's the technical term. Technical yeah. term for it. I it, love it. It reminds me of when you um, catch a fly and pull one of its legs off. That seems to me what you've done here. It's the yeah, five, the yeah, five-legged exactly. fly. Um, okay, all right. Let's get into the topper plays of the week. Topper plays of the week. Brought to you by Leader NZ's Lasagna Topper. We're going to go from three up to one. So reverse order as it's written in front of you, gentlemen. Uh, in at number three, the Up the Waz Afro Man Remix. I'm excited for Up The Wires Fever to continue next year. Um, yeah, absolutely. We've got our own uh, highlight uh, compendium of songs that we made throughout the National Rugby League season this year, and that's coming in at number two. This is Now That's What I Call Rugby League, Volume 1. The Alternative Commentary Collective's <laughs> Mad Monday podcast presents Now That's What I Call Rugby League, Volume 1. Why don't you put on me Nice dragon spire. Hands. Reserve hooker for the eels. <laughs> Brendan Hands. <laughs> Reaching out. Pass to me. Pass it to you. <laughs> Soul of the Shawnee Jebony Ukore. Mr. Ravalawa. Mm. Mr. Ravalawa. Hey, girl. Mr. Ravalawa. And I popped it up in Jebony. And he flipped it on the inside. Na 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 let the bunties hit the floor. Let the bunties hit the floor. Let the bunties hit the floor. Let the bunties hit the. 
Now that's what I call Rugby League, Volume 1. Out now. That one took us a lot longer to make than it should have. Uh, in fact, so <laughs> yep. long that we released it 24 hours before the Warriors were kicked out of the National Rugby League <laughs> and that most yeah. of the players we were referring to in that uh, were no longer playing <laughs> by the time that was released. That sucked up so much resources um, <laughs> from the wider ACC, NZ, me, media group mm. that people actually lost their jobs for that. <laughs> It was worth it. Yeah, well, look, it was look, well worth it. Listen, totally worth it. I mean, how many people died uh, putting the Football World Cup together in Qatar? You know, <laughs> <laughs> these are, it's collateral damage, and I've got to be honest with you, it was worth it. Uh, coming in at number one, the top of play of the week, all of the great New Zealanders who went to Brisbane, Brisbane and got absolutely hammered, sung songs, and took over Caxton Street. <laughs> We've got to get there next year. We've got to get to Jackson Street yeah, at some point. Yeah, totally. I reckon magic round. Get, we've got to get there. Yeah, yeah, get there. Let's go. All, All right. right. Okay. Well, Seem busy. Let's knock this one on the head. All and, right. And uh, we'll see you guys tomorrow for the Daily Agenda. Yeah. All right. All right. You've been listening to the ACC's Agenda Podcast. For more episodes, subscribe on iHeartRadio or wherever you get your podcasts.